Um, hello. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, my name's Kieran. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I've watched a lot of the talks uh, that have come from this conference online over the years, so it's really nice to be here and be able to, uh, to talk back to the TV. No. Uh, so, um, so to start off, so I lead user research over at Reach Robotics, which is based in Bristol. Um, if you don't know where Bristol is, it's about two hours, kind of that way, uh, give or take. Um, I'm here to talk about robotics, which I think is hopefully kind of uh, useful for, for a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, because robotics itself, you know, consumer robotics, is on the rise. So I think it's a helpful thing to, to start playing with. And, and as user researchers, you know, we need to be able to work with, with any of these new kind of entertainment mediums that come out, be, be they robotics, VR, voice interaction, whatever it happens to be. Um, so, so I'm mostly going to be talking about uh, Mechamon, which is a Reach Robotics uh, kind of robot product. Here he is, kind of waving at you. Um, I thought it might be helpful to, to begin to sort of give you a sense of, of what, what uh, it's kind of about. So Mechamon is basically, it's a robot, which is controlled through an app on your phone, but it also has some interactions that you can do with, with the robot itself. It's kind of interesting, I think, because it offers a real range of gaming experiences. There's like a free drive mode, we kind of walk around with it. There's um, kind of... These two people here are having kind of a, a multiplayer battle because they're in the same place. Uh, there's also augmented reality, so we can all enjoy the social awkwardness as I try and get this video working. Um, yep, yeah, there we go. That's what I was aiming for. Um, <laughs> so um, let's just try this. There we go. Yeah, so this is like there's an augmented reality mode where you can kind of build an augmented reality play space in, in your living room or, or kitchen or wherever and play against virtual opponents. And then on top of that, there's kind of a... Um, a sort of stop motion animation mode as well, where he can do fun things like this, <coughs> which, is, which is kind of good. So, um, so this, you know, as you start to think about this, and as you probably start to think for yourself as, as user researchers, the types of things that you'd be exploring um, with, with this, with, with Mechamon, that's kind of some of the interesting areas. And I think that working with robotics can be quite a, a challenging research environment. Um, because, and I want to sort of present some of the difficulties that, that we've experienced in terms of doing research, but also some of the ways uh, around them. And my hope from doing this talk today is that if you walk away and you start doing research with, with robots, at least you know, you'll have um, <laughs> learned from some of the things that I've got wrong <laughs> over the time. Um, so, uh, so to begin with, there's, there's quite a lot that I want to kind of cram in. So I've broken it down into three areas. First is, is really lessons from, from lab-based testing with robots. Second is, you know, if you think about robotics, necessarily it involves hardware and those sort of timelines. So it's sort of lessons about how your user research can support um, product, product design. And then lastly is this um, a bit of detail around sort of, I suppose, how we work with audiences and segmentation uh, in looking at, um, at gaming robots. So... Uh, this is like the uber uber uh, kind of um, like practical bit. So lots of very sort of practical lessons from testing testing in the lab. So um, this is obviously not a photo of the lab, uh, much as it would be amusing to go around users on tracks with a camera. Um, this is from recording a trailer. But it's to start to talk about the sense of, of kind of the recording itself. So if you're going to work with, with gaming robots, uh, they're different to games in some ways, in the sense that they're quite noisy, uh, they walk under things, uh, they get trapped, they do things that games don't do. Users don't sit next to them. Quite often they're obviously across the other side of the room. So this leads to some quite different practicalities in your, in your, in your recording of your, of your lab sessions. So firstly, uh, on, on the kind of noise side, uh, sadly you can't really do this to them uh, to sort of quieten them down which is one of our users put tiny tennis balls on the feet uh, to, to make it quieter as a kind of joke that they tweeted out or, or put on Instagram. And so, but, but, but seriously, with, with recording, you do need to think about this because uh, if your recording setup may not work that well, basically, with, with uh, robots because of the noise and the physical noise they're making around the room. So, so reach in our kind of testing room, there's a kind of sofa where the users um, sit and I kind of sit next to them and our, and our microphone is actually between myself and the, and the participant of the testing. That's because you need to get a really crisp um, sound of what they're doing as they're playing the game, perhaps as you're testing something. So it sounds like a small practical thing, but that's something you need to kind of be aware of when you're testing. Um, second thing is really around the, when you're recording is the, the types of captures you'll need to make of the session. So as games user researchers, you know, you're probably used to capturing like the face, you know, the screen, and the kind of device, the control device you're using. 
But on top of that, I'd suggest if you're doing testing with kind of gaming robots, you probably need to think about uh, capturing the actual robot itself, getting a, getting a feed on that robot, because the games team will be interested in looking at the robot, understanding what it's doing, how it's reacting particularly. And then you're going to need to be capturing the interaction between the user and the robot as well, because that's something that's, that lends quite a lot of interesting detail. And to give a really practical example of that, uh, one of the things that we have is um, a kind of the augmented reality setup process with Mechamon, you know, the user has to go through some steps to build their play space. Um, and that's, that's an interaction that when we were designing the setup for that and the steps to guide users through the process of setting up their play space in their living room or their kitchen or whatnot, is something that the team wanted to have a really good sight on so they could truly understand what the user was doing and how effective those, those instructions during the setup were. Okay, next thing is, um, I don't know uh, if you guys use mobile sleds. Has anyone used like a mobile sled in their work? No? Okay, cool, surprisingly. Okay, it's cool, cool. Okay, so some, um, so, uh, so if you don't use sleds, because this is obviously a hand, you know, uh, it's controlled primarily through your phone, I would say that it's absolutely important that you use sleds, but it's a little bit different. So if you look around, a lot of those are around, uh, they're kind of built in static positions, so they're kind of for capturing sort of document cameras or something like that. So you need something which is a lot more flexible and I return uh, with great thanks and, uh, to, to Sam Hales from Polk, uh, which is an agency in London, for sharing these uh, blog posts where he describes how we went about making one at Polk, which is super useful, and I'm very grateful to him for sharing these. And basically, it just means that you've got a camera on your phone so you can capture the user's interactions with that device, with that controller. It's super helpful, and it gives you really different data than just doing a screen capture on the device because you can see all the types of things they're trying to do with their thumbs, you know, where they're hitting, not hitting targets, that kind of stuff. So I'd say that's really helpful. And on top of that, um, having something flexible, because, you know, if you think about your user doing an augmented reality game with a robot, you know, they're kind of running around the room a little bit. So you have to be able to have something which is flexible enough to be able to capture them using it in lots of different positions. Uh, so that's kind of uh, mobile sleds. Um, yeah, cool. So uh, next thing is about sessions themselves. So obviously, you are, uh, as user researchers, I'm sure, uh, some of the most organized people out there. Um, so, but you need to be even more organized, perhaps, when you've got robotics involved, because there's loads of different variables. So you've got, uh, potentially, you're going to be testing with different robots, because if you're dealing with early stage work or prototypes, you're going to have different builds, perhaps, on each of those different robots. So you're going to be dealing with different robots. On top of that, you may have multiple types of robots, because you're going to be using multiplayer. On top of that, you're probably going to have different devices, because there might be different builds on different phones or, or tablets. And on top of that, you are going to be having tablets and phones. So you're going to be having a lot of different things, potentially, in the session with you at one time. So that could be a bit of a, bit of a sort of um, a mission to keep track of it, because you need to be thinking about charging them, all that kind of stuff, all the way through the session. Um, and because you're working with hardware as well, you know, there's lots of stuff that can go wrong, like you will lose guns, legs will break, things will run out of battery, all this kind of stuff. So there's quite a lot of things to kind of keep track on. So a couple of tips from, from me on that is, um, firstly, uh, it's really helpful if you can to have your own dedicated testing robots that you can keep up to date with firmware, all that kind of stuff, because that means that you know that your equipment is ready to go, um, whatever's happening. Um, second thing is it's really helpful to have uh, the team kind of around as far as possible. So for example, when we test, I always have Slack open on my computer so the team can message me because they'll be seeing stuff that I won't necessarily see, partly because I might be in the session, you know, focused on that. But on top of that, because you know, you know, they're, they're the engineers, they're working with the robot all the time. So they'll be able to see things that you just won't be able to see perhaps. Uh, and on top of that, um, uh, I used to work in theatre. I don't know about the Venn diagram of people who used to work in stage management and user research. It's probably relatively small. Um, but there's a couple of tips from that that I found really useful. So one thing you do uh, in theatre is you have like a set and a reset list. So you have a list of everything that needs to happen before the thing starts and everything that needs to happen afterwards. So it's really good to have a really strong set of like, this is exactly what needs to be in place before my session starts. And a reset list of like, oh, I need to charge this. Do you know what I mean? I need to get my incentive, charge this, get this consent form. Those kind of set and reset lists are really helpful. And on top of that, because I talked about all these different robots you might have or different phones or different devices, uh, there's something you, you do with props tables in theatre, which is where you lay them out on a table and you kind of make a grid with tape or something like that, and you label, and you put each thing in a box on the grid, and you label it. And then that way, when you look at your table, 
you know at a glance whether you're missing a robot or whether your consent form isn't there or anything like that. That's a nice sort of helpful thing to get into because it just means you can look at your table for the start of the session and just go, yep, everything's there. Or certainly, damn, <laughs> where's my robot? <laughs> um, so, um, so a couple of things there just to kind of help keep, keep organized in sessions. Uh, this is another thing. Interior design is sadly not always your friend, uh, particularly if you're testing with augmented reality because the environment itself is a variable, you know? So that means that that's going to affect your test, sometimes in ways that you don't necessarily realize it's going to. Um, so as a really sort of practical example of that, we were doing some early uh, testing with augmented reality, and we were testing in a space that happened to have a rug that was an extraordinarily similar color to the AR tracker on the back of the robot. Um, now, that isn't what we were testing. And obviously, it's a great thing. Yeah, we noticed it, the engineers worked on it, and they ironed out the, the issue. But basically, it just meant that it threw my test out of place. And that wasn't what we were testing. It's great that we surfaced it. But that is something you need to consider in terms of your, of your testing. Because you know, if you've got a plan for your testing, as we looked at earlier, or a strategy with a plan associated with it, you, know, you need to think about how that may be knocked off kilter because of variables that you weren't aware of, like that damn rug. Um, so, so that's something to kind of be aware of. Uh, and another thing that's probably useful to be aware of if you're going to be testing with robots uh, is that people don't walk into the room uh, without baggage. People walk into the room with things like this in their mind. Um, you know, they, people have preconceptions about robots that they may have uh, taken from films or media, and they'll generally walk, this, walk with this into your testing room. So you need to be aware of that because people will have multiple simultaneous reactions. Like they'll look at it and they'll be like really super interested, but a bit scared, you know, and that's something that'll be going on. Now, obviously, if you're testing first impressions, that's great. That's exactly what you want to be happening. But if you're actually trying to test something a little bit further down the line when they're a bit more comfortable, something to do with controls or something, you've, you've got to find a way to get people over that pretty sort of quickly. So um, from, from my point of view, things that I found useful is to uh, basically get them as comfortable as you can with it fast. And the way to do that is to really think about the, the locus of control. So that's about putting them in control as much as possible as early on. So generally, I start with them putting it together. You know, that's kind of an initial part, so they feel more in control of it. On top of that, I always start them off in the, the kind of free drive mode, which is where they can walk around and control it, because that's the maximum control they have over the robot at that time. So it's really about finding ways to put them in a position of control and increasing their comfort as rapidly as possible in order that you can get on with the, the kind of stuff you want to be doing in this particular test. Cool. OK, so that was like a bunch of really practical stuff about testing, everything from recording to thinking about how we get people comfortable. Um, next thing I think it might be worth looking at is um, product design, right? So the thing about uh, hardware, how many of you kind of work with hardware in your jobs? OK, so some of us, not, not, not lots, but certainly some of us. OK, so thinking about this, so hardware it necessarily means long iteration cycles. You know, you might be asked to be involved in a product and to think about contributing research to a product that you know, is six months, a year, possibly even longer ahead, right? So that's a challenging place to be. Um, and so you, you, know, you can't just sort of make mock-ups or something like that. It's quite new. And a lot of the stuff, especially in this sort of technology, is new. So there aren't as many precedents for you to sort of deal with. So um, some sort of tips, I think, on this front. First thing, you know, can't have a presentation without talking about relationships in organizations. <laughs> uh, first thing I say is it's really important to have good relationships with all the departments involved in the build so you can kind of inform the decision making. Um, and particularly with hardware, like there's a lot of decision points throughout the development process. And I think it's really helpful to have user research informing those, those potential decision points. Uh, and, I, and as ever, I would say get involved as early as possible. Um, that's partly because, particularly with hardware, things get more fixed the further down the line you go. Um, but also because the engineers you're working with, um, they, may not, they may not necessarily think of how user research could support. Not because they're not open to it. In fact, the, you know, the guys at Reach Robotics, the engineers, are really welcome and interested in the role of user research and design. But because they won't necessarily know how you can contribute to it. And I think that's something that, for us, uh, as user researchers, it's really our job to think about how we can best design and create new types of tests to support um, these teams, the design and the engineering teams, building this kind of stuff. And for me personally, 
I think that's where the most exciting stuff is, because you get to kind of think and design of new types of tests, and that's always really cool, right? Um, so I say that to a room, and I'm hoping that this is the room in all the world that would agree with me on that point. Um, so, but obviously your first step is to kind of be aware of, of the decisions in the first place, and that means building good relationships with the team. Um, so, once you've built your awesome relationship, uh, we can think about uh, developing the actual test itself, I think, can feel um, a little bit sort of chicken and egg sometimes. Uh, because you know, engineers obviously want to have the results from the testing, um, but you haven't got anything that you can put in front of users to test with. Right? So, um, so at this point, I think it's really helpful, uh, and one of the things we do a lot at uh, Reach is to really think of, well, remember the kind of ethos of a prototype. You know, a prototype is to test one thing well. Like that's what a well-crafted prototype does. And that's a kind of discipline uh, that I think we have to take into our testing as well. And so for me, it's about really trying to understand what the specific interaction is that you're attempting to test for. There may be multiple interactions, but it's about establishing which of those individually are that you're trying to understand, you know, isolating that interaction, and then working with the engineers, perhaps to build different versions of that, and then taking that and wrapping something around it, wrapping a believable kind of shell around it so that you can put it in front of users and test that specific sort of isolated interaction. And how we do that, to be honest with you, is we do a lot of kind of 3D printing um, and you know, kind of that, that sort of that sort of approach, um, and lots of glitter, obviously, no glitter. Um, no, so so that that idea of really kind of building prototypes. So um, so that's say so that that's kind of one approach to prototyping. If that's not working, another idea is, is sometimes when you're trying to inform design and you don't have a product that you can actually test. Um, I think some of the key usability principles that I'm sure everyone in here uh, knows about, <laughs> otherwise you probably wouldn't be in here, um, can really inform your product design. And as ever, you know, huge kind of kudos and thanks to Jacob Nielsen for sharing this post, which is like 20, 23 years, I think, ago. So I want to give a few examples about how these kind of usability heuristics can still be really useful when you're, when you're, when you're designing um, and working with hardware. So uh, one example of this, one kind of common heuristic is that idea of visibility of system status. You know, the fact that you can see what's going on with the system at any one time. So obviously that can be things like thinking about how you're designing the visibility of the battery level or, you know, the, the, the user being shot or shot at. But one area that this became particularly helpful to us was um, one of the interactions that you could have with, with the robot is that uh, if you take your, his shields away, he gets pretty grumpy about that. If you take his guns away, he gets pretty grumpy. Um, but if you put them back, uh, he kind of gets a bit happier. So let's see if we can get this working. And that, yeah, so this kind of idea, this thinking about this persistence, in this case, of an emotional state, like how long should that state persist for? Now that's something where that, that heuristic about visibility of status, because that's the status of the robot, right? So thinking about how long should that persist for? How long is that continuously valuable to the user? That was a heuristic that helped us um, in that front. Uh, second thing is um, this one match between system and the real world. So, you know, robots are quite hard to make, uh, it turns out, and require super skillful engineers. And we're very lucky at Reach because we've got lots of those. But, but engineers often uh, can use quite complex terms <laughs> sometimes. And this needs to be avoided or at least translated um, for the user. So if we're looking specifically at the, the, the place of augmented reality, you know, an AR setup process is tremendously technically complicated, you know, kind of triangulating ground planes, all this kind of stuff. And that's just not stuff that needs to be communicated to the user. So following this kind of overall heuristic of trying to get the system to talk in a way that makes as much sense to the user as possible in their own world is incredibly important and means that you can start to reduce that type of stuff to telling the user to hold their phone in the right place and not cover the lens. Um, so that's, that's our side. And the third one I thought it might be helpful to talk about is um, a, this idea of user control and freedom. So another one of these heuristics. But um, you know, the idea that the user always has control over the system at any one time. And you know, particularly if you're dealing with, with robotics, you know, some of this stuff can be quite expensive uh, and complex. And users are worried about breaking it or doing something they can't go back on. So the idea of uh, giving them the space to be able to reset, to be able to come back out of it, to have the confidence to pick it up and play with it, is an incredibly important idea to include. 
And so a really practical example of that, this is the sort of free drive uh, mode on the, on the app. These are the kind of control sticks. And you can do all sorts of changes if you want to. You can change its height, its body, the way it walks, like heaps and heaps of changes, which potentially may be intimidating to a user coming to it for the first time, right? Because there's so many different things they can change, but you put a big fat reset button on it so they know they can always kind of bring it back to its original status. So I just wanted to share those as kind of three different ways that you know, you're talking about prototyping, and if the prototyping angle isn't working for you for whatever reason, we can fall back, and I continuously fall back on these kind of guiding heuristics to really help us inform design decisions, um, even when I can't do any research because the thing doesn't exist yet. Um, and the last phase I thought it might be helpful to look at and talk a little bit about is sort of understanding and segmenting kind of users a bit more. So, um, you know, like gaming robots uh, have really diverse audiences. Um, you, and you may be managing multiple needs at any one time. So, you know, you're going to have, like, people who are super into robots. You're going to have people who are, like, casual gamers. You may even have, like, hardcore gamers. So you've got this range of people. So all of our, you know, kind of normal rules apply about, like, you know, doing kind of all our customer research and post-purchase interviews, all that sort of stuff. But I wanted to talk a little bit about the framework to help sort of understand, um, the kind of, I guess, understanding how those audi audiences fit together. And something that I've been using a lot of at Reach Robotics is Jobs To Be Done. You guys, who sort of knows about Jobs To Be Done? Who's sort of been using that in their work? OK, cool. So not, so I didn't know how much of it to say. So Jobs To Be Done is a kind of, uh, it originally came out of marketing originally, but it's been taken across into user research as a way of understanding and, and framing your users' needs from your product. So um, I won't go into the theory of it too much now, um, but. Uh, there's some really great places to look if you're interested. Uh, Clayton Christensen is obviously somewhere to look at. Alan Clement runs a really great um, Jobs to be Done blog. Uh, Intercom, who are a kind of company of really kind of led uh, how it can be used in their own practice. And the Rewired Group in the States um, also uh, uh, done really a lot of work on this. And, and the way that kind of Jobs to be Done takes is to help you think about your product, not really about the product, but about the user in terms of their goal. What are they trying to do with your product? Where are they trying to get to? And they kind of hire your product as a way of getting them towards that goal. So like really practically, you know, um, I don't know, you're like sitting at your computer and you're a bit bored uh, and you're a bit hungry. So, you know, that's the kind of thing. So like if you were just thinking about that in terms of a product satisfying a need, you think, ah, oh, this person's hungry. Like but there are any number of things you could use to, to get over that, 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 that kind of need you've got. You know, you could eat uh, an apple, a chocolate bar, you could get up and go for a walk, you could have a coffee, you could distract yourself by talking to your colleague. And they're all very, very, very different types of products which will help you address that need. And that's the kind of key of it, is unlocking this more flexible way of thinking about um, how, you, how you address and sort of uh, meet users' needs to help them progress towards where they want to get to. And why that's helpful for, for me in terms of looking at the research and framing the research for, for a gaming robot is that it means that we can start to think about the uses of this product in different contexts. So for example, you, you could just come to it and go, it's a cool gaming robot, let's focus on the game modes. But actually, like, Maybe it's about working with a group, of, a, a group of people who enjoy fighting each other. That's like a social thing. And for that, they could be, they could be doing an online multiplayer game. Sure. But they could also be playing poker. Do you know what I mean? Or they could also be, I don't know, playing like football together. They're all like a sort of social competitive activity. But maybe they're using this product like, like a Mechamon as a fighting robot to do that. And understanding that context really helps you understand how to develop the gaming modes. Um, or equally, it could be a parent who's trying to give their kids like the best kind of start. So they're trying to help introduce them to new technologies when they're younger. And they're picking it up because they want to think about how you can program a robot. You know, that's a very different focus. But understanding that broader goal in that context, which is hugely different, will really help you inform how you develop it. Or you know, equally, as someone who wants to spend time with their family, and actually what your product is going up against in the context is perhaps going to the cinema, or you know, watching the TV, or, or playing a board game. So understanding that context, I think, is really helpful for you understanding how to think about developing the kind of design of the games and also how you reach out with your research. And I think that kind of gives us that, particularly with gaming robots or with any new technology, it is really helpful for three kind of major reasons. Uh, firstly, it really keeps you grounded in user needs and means you don't get caught up in features, both for you and for the people you work with. 
Secondly, it really ensures that you think about the diversity of the audiences who are coming to your kind of experience, and you don't just get stuck in like preconceived ideas that like gaming robots are for teenage boys. Do you know what I mean? You kind of get really able to open that and understand the context a lot more richly, which is really important. Um, and lastly, that um, because these jobs to be done are kind of consistent over time and persistent, people always want to be entertained. They'll always want to hang out with their friends. So it helps you figure out ways in which your robot um, or you know, whatever you happen to be working on can kind of keep abreast of what these people's needs are. So there's a real range. I just want to kind of think about how that framing can help you steer both your research, but also how that research informs the development of your product and can help support your teams. OK, so let's kind of bring this sort of area together. So there's three sort of main things. First point is don't be scared of robots. They're super fun. Uh, and it's a really exciting place to work because there's loads of different types of approach that you can have. Um, secondly, three main sort of takeaways. Firstly, if you're going to be doing this type of work with gaming robots, don't forget about the practicalities, silly stuff like where your microphone is, do you know what I mean? knowing about all of your reset materials, that's really important stuff. And um, secondly, you already have the tools to do the research, to research with this type of approach. Um, but you may have to be a little bit more creative in how you apply them, for example, within prototyping, or you may have to reach back to some of your core principles and think about how you can apply them to, to different settings. And then the last one is really um, kind of understanding your users and especially those kind of core persistent needs that, that kind of change over time. Because I think if you really dig into those with your research and understand them, you can understand how your product can uh, help address those needs you know, and like, make their lives better, which is what we're all here for. Uh, that's it. Um, thanks very much. Anyone who's got any reflections or uh, questions or anything like that? <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, so you work on something super cool, super sexy. How do, you, <laughs> how do you get past the wow factor when you're presenting this object to a new player, a new play tester? How do you get their, you know, past the point that they're just looking at and just going, this is so amazing, if, even if it's just sitting on the floor twitching. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really good point. And I guess, um, so for me, the, a bit of that's about the, that kind of idea of control. So putting them in control of it as much as possible from early on, because that way they kind of see it in sections and they can kind of build up, I suppose, to a bit, rather than kind of going in like all sort of all showing and all dancing, unless that's what you want to test. But I think the other thing about that is, is longitudinal testing as well. So it's sort of outside of the lab, um, you know, diary studies, that kind of thing as well have been useful to sort of see how people feel kind of over time. Both of those, I think, are sort of interesting ways around it. Um, yeah, I'd say that's all right. Hi. Thanks. Um, are you able to talk, like, obviously, once you've got these kind of, given what you're saying about the, the, the time it takes for kind of physical product design and that kind of uh, process. Obviously, you'll do a lot of qualitative research when you're trying to understand the kind of human factors as they're trying to use it and figure it out and play with it. Once you've actually like built a version of one of these robots and launched it, what kind of quantitative measure, like research, do you do any practicing like that? Is there data that you are getting in any format from that, or could you talk a bit more about that side of the research that you do? Sure. Yeah. So there is there is um, the there there is like analytics data which is. Uh, which is collected sort of around robots when they're being used. Um, and some of that is stuff like their, their player stats, so there's like a, a rankings, German rankings board and stuff like that, so people kind of know how many games they've won or lost and that side of things. Are they connected? Uh, did, I obviously haven't looked at these robots yet, but are they connected to Wi-Fi and that sort of thing? Or? Yeah, definitely, yeah. So, they, so that's the thing, yeah. So, um, and also because you're using the app, the app, you know, you log in, you create an account. No, sure, yeah, so you kind of create an account, so that can keep track of sort of how well you're doing as a player. So that type of data is really helpful too, yeah, in terms of that kind of longer testing. And that's, I think, one of the interesting and exciting things about it is like, especially with um, something like Mechamon, because there's quite a few different things you can do, you know, like combat, you know, AR sort of combat, combat with another robot, stop motion animation. So sort of understanding how and where different people play with it in different times, that's, that's a really important part of it. So yeah, it's a good, great point to bring up. Hi there. Hi. I was interested in um, about the audience. So with the um, 
research and you get and you find out who, who wants the product, do you think of new products which would like, address the new audience or do you come from the engineer's perspective and then see like, who the audience will be? Like, so I think, uh, so we're pretty focused, so we just launched a new V2 kind of Mechamon like a month or so ago. So um, yeah, focus is definitely on thinking about that robot and how you can address it. And there was a big relaunch of the app as well. So I think one of the things about uh, this, the Mechamon as a, as a product is that you can play lots of different things with it. So you can use it in lots of different ways. So I think that's probably where, where my head's at. If you see what I mean, sort of understanding it as a tool, I suppose, and understand how people can do different things they want to do, which I guess is that kind of jobs to be done thing, which is like, do you know what I mean? If they're spending more time playing with their friends and the, that social side of it is really big, it's like, okay, cool. How can that be support more? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's kind of why I wanted to raise that sort of jobs to be done approach, because for me, that's a real route about thinking about product development yeah, and understanding how to frame the research that comes in, if that makes sense. That's for me why that's kind of sort of locked into the approach. Yeah, thank you. May I do a question? Please. Uh, I'd like to ask about jobs to be done, if I may. Uh, I think in, in mainstream UX, it tends to be like a practical task the user has to execute. Is that what's at the top of your job to be done, or is it like is there fun somehow at the top? Uh, there's, yeah, it's definitely sort of above that, I think. So, so like, um, it's something called job scoping within jobs to be done. And um, that's about sort of what level is your job coming in. And I think the really important thing about jobs to be done for me personally is that sense that those jobs are persistent and consistent over time. So, for example, you know, playing with friends. You know, that's, that's something that's there. And for me, I, I don't know, I, I, I feel really passionate about this because it's like it enables you to think about the trajectory of your product over time and how would it continuously need, how would it continue to be part of that user's life over time. And I think that's really interesting when we think about games more broadly, you know. Like, um, I guess I was thinking that earlier today when we talk about free-to-play games and what role they play in users' lives and how will that continue to be needed over time. Do you know, so I think that trajectory is really important, which is why I think it's sort of framed in that slightly higher level. Yeah, if that makes sense. And are those jobs coming from the development intent behind the product, or are they coming from data somehow? That's, um, so I think that's a really interesting point. Um, hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think probably sort of a bit of both, because there's an affordance of the product and the design, which enables us to make certain experiences possible. But then for me, the really exciting part of the research is, particularly with kind of newer technologies, saying, well, how are people applying this in ways that you don't always think about? You know? um, and we see that with all games. We heard that you know, during the last brilliant talk about how people were using it in a slightly different way than we thought. But that's the really exciting thing about how does this product kind of mesh with people's lives, you know? And therefore, and, but also, how do you make sense of that as a, as a researcher? And how do you frame it so that it can be usefully sort of abstracted and, and inform things? Yeah, if that makes sense. Thank you. All right. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. Thank you.